Once again, I am so thrilled to welcome back my friend Yuko to Framing the Hammer. The first time we did this, we might have had some sound issues, so we're going to recreate the magic, and it's always a pleasure because Yuko is uh, one of my favorite dinner companions, and I'm excited to be able to uh, pretend that we're having dinner together, even though we're doing this virtually. So, Yuko, welcome. Tell us about yourself. Thank you for having me, Gavin. Um, so, yes, uh, my name is Yuko. I am from Japan. Uh, I came to the United States um, about two decades ago, um, and uh, uh, currently I work as an art therapist in the clinical setting uh, with a people with mental illness, severe mental illness, uh, and the history of violence. It is so fascinating to be able to talk with people like you, especially in the context of our organization, 4As, the American Alliance of Artists and Audiences, because we certainly believe that art is a way of helping our entire society. One of our values is that all arts, excuse me, equitable access to all arts for all people can help tackle all problems. Before we jump too much into the nitty gritty of uh, what it is you do, can you tell me, I would love to start off our conversations with just hearing about an art piece or a cultural experience you've had recently that just stuck with you. Uh, for example, this morning I went for a bike ride and I listened to a lot of Beyonce's latest album, <laughs> Renaissance. Uh, uh -huh. And I gotta say, I it was it was it's a pretty artistic work that really motivated me. It just made me feel so good, and I was jamming on my bike. Is there anything yeah. recently that you have experienced that made you say, "Thank goodness for uh, for uh, human creativity"? Uh well, actually. The 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 eye opening uh, moment that I had recently was actually when uh, we were drawing self portraits. Um, actually, the portraits of each other um, with my kids. I have five years old and nine years old, and we're sitting on the table, round table, and then we drew each other. So my son was drawing me. I was drawing my daughter. My daughter was drawing my son, and then we swapped it around. And that the portraits that my son drew was just so fascinating. Um, and of course, five years uh, old, you know, he has this curiosity for the sexuality, like in a very innocent way. And the way he drew my body sort of transparent. <laughs> <laughs> and um, it's just, you know, it blew my mind in a way like how we project our own thoughts onto the arts, right? Like, so, so if somebody saw my son's drawing without knowing his background and his age, so that, oh, he's sexually preoccupied, mm -hmm. could easily say so, or psychotic, right? Mm -hmm. But knowing who he is and where he is, he, he, he has been at this point, um, you know, it makes sense to me. And uh, that was, yes, I had an amazing moment working with... Um, my patients and my clients every day but mm -hmm. that was just really eye-opening um in terms of the art and yeah you know just innocence and uh sometimes we read too much of it. <laughs> yes sometimes yeah we should sometimes just keep it simple but in the simplicity it's uh just drawing things as you feel them and the and tapping into our subconscious and our super conscious and then mm -hmm. keep bringing it all together huh <laughs> yes yes um, tell us about what your day-to-day -day routine looks like as you work with your patients. Not all of my groups are art therapy. Um, I have music appreciation. I have uh, physical activities. Um, so, yes, I see them in a different group setting, a different context. Um, but it's it's always, my goal is very, I'm trying to simplify my goal. Uh, if I can, you know, make uh, patients smile one day, then I did my job. Or if I make, you know, patients' day um, fun and I did my job. So it's not like I'm here to heal people and then I make this, you know, people, um, uh, the treat people, the treating people, yes, but not heal people and do the magic and then I'm making a society better place in one day. No, I'm just doing what I can do day to day. And if they have 
an easier day, uh, then I did my job. Can you give an example of what uh, what you do to present with them and work alongside and um, try to accomplish with them? So I, I actually thinking about the project is one of my favorite things to do. So since um, this is really uh, actually like a decades ago, a long time ago, but we uh, while I was interning at the place. Um, very similar to where I work right now uh, was a juvenile um, juvenile um, the treatment place uh, the kids had mental issues and uh, impulsivity so what we did back then was we um, it's called island project and um, so each one of the the patients create the island of its home um, we gave them like plasters and clay. So it's a three-dimensional uh, thing. And then it's very handy. It's like, it's not bigger. You know, it's about like five by eight uh, size. And after they created the island, we asked them to create inhabitant that lives in the island. We don't say create a human, create an animal. No, just ask them to create inhabitant. And then after they create their own, island and inhabitant we had this like big table and then we roll out the the giant paper and then we paint it in all blue like body of water and then we asked them uh to place their island wherever they want on the on you know in the ocean on the on the ocean in the ocean and then after they do so, and it's like, it's every step, it tells a lot about this patient. Um, historically, so the people who, I mean, you know, both, right? Mental illness, that's definitely separate them from the society um, or they feel like they, they are not included in a society because of their mental illness. But then in addition to their mental illness, having this criminal background, the history of violence, um, impulsivity, um, that make them even further from the society. So it's very interesting to see how these patients like place themselves in the body of ocean. None of them place like in the center of the ocean. It's a lot, a lot of time it's a corner of the, the oceans and the side of the oceans, very isolated. And then we ask them to create a way to communicate each other's um, each other's islands if there's any way that they can build some kind of like transportations or you know magical thinking like magical thoughts then so they create their uh, they they created their own way of communicating it was really fascinating and the patients created like you know this like hidden um, ship. Or they, some one made this like airplane um, and one group created this like very fancy um, tram, you know, like a tram system, like to go to Roosevelt Island. Yeah, sort of. exactly. Oh, wow. Yes. That's fascinating. Um, <laughs> so some people created this tram system and it was just so fascinating. And what it does is this the transportation or any like method that they want to communicate with each other, it translates their desire and also ability to um, return, you know, when they're returning to the community, um, they should have a connection with the society, right? Because isolation right. really creates and exacerbates mental illness mm -hmm. and also their tendency to go back and, Come, you know, the recidivism and all of that. So it's very important to encourage, especially these clients, these patients, um, that they are part of the society. They're part of the community. They are included. They're welcome. They don't have to be shamed. They don't have to um, feel that they're bad people. And so, that's one of your goals in your therapeutic work is to help them feel included again and to help yes. them um, turn their backs on shame to be able to progress with their lives, huh? Yes, absolutely. Yes. Yes. Another thing we, this is like very recent things we did um, in a Japanese term. Um, 
there's a word called ikigai. Ikigai means the reason for being. It's like essentially it's like life purpose. And we encouraged um, patients to come up their own ikigai. So ikigai is essentially what you love, what the world needs, what you can be paid for, and what uh, you're good at. And all the four circles overlap, and that's where you your ikigai, like reason for being, like life purpose. Oh. So the the reason why I introduced this concept to our patients is because, you know, a lot of them, when they go back to the community or society, they feel like they just have to live with this labeled um um, you know, there's just the numbers and they label. So I wanted to encourage them. You, it's, that's not only, that's not only part of who you are. You mm-hmm. are who you were before you came here. So I wanted to give them an opportunity to really, um, how do I say, to uh, enrich who they are and to uh-huh. realize, to give them, you know, to to, to provide uh, themselves an opportunity to explore who they are. And that they are um, multidimensional. They're not just yes. the, the sum of the poor choices they've made. There's, yes. there's, there's good in them as well, huh? Yes, definitely. definitely. Is there a tremendous amount of shame um, with the people that you work with? Yes. And uh-huh. it unspoken shame unspoken shame so it's uh, another project we did in the past though i said we because i take um, interns from um from school and so myself and interns we always collaborate uh and work together uh to provide a project so one year i had an intern who was very good at doll making so we came up with this project uh, based on the movie called Inside Out. Um, oh, yes, of course. Yes, fantastic Disney. movie. Yes, the fantastic movie. Um, and a lot of, like, one, one, one of the things, one of the, um, one of the things I noticed about these patients, like, they, they are not accessing their emotions, right? Like, they don't know, they they experience what they experience, but instead of articulating what they're experiencing or saying like I'm frustrated, I, you know, I feel resentful, they act on those feelings. And that is impulsivity, that is gonna get them to the in get them into the trouble, mm-hmm. right? Like the legal trouble. Mm-hmm. So through the Inside Out project, we encourage the patients to really look into their emotions that lived in their head. Mm. And as you know, in the movie, there are like five primary emotions, right? Like yeah. anger, sadness, um, you know, disgust, mm-hmm. uh, like all of like five emotions. Right. And, you know, we watched the movie together and we talked about it and we encouraged the patients to come up their own character that lives in their head. Ah. And it was really fascinating. And I think this might be very specific with the people I work with. Uh, guilt came up. A couple people created the character of guilt, which is not in the movie. Mm-hmm. Right? So guilt was one. Shame was uh, fewer people, but shame definitely came up. Um and jealousy, yes, jealousy came up. So again, those three characters were not in the movie or something that we may not think as a primary, you know, emotions, yet these populations um, do experience these emotions as like, you know, it's, 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 a, it's a big character in their yeah. head. They're, it's so. a profound element of their lives and their yes. identity. Uh, what did they do with these dolls? Um, they took very good care of these dolls. It was so interesting. When they leave the room, they wanted to make sure these dolls going to be placed in a safe place. They'll be protected. So it was very interesting, fascinating process. Um, I mean, you know, just like you say, Gabriel, like just to engage in art, creative activity will take your mind off from you know, this moment, right? Yeah. So that itself was very therapeutic for them. Um, and, you know, the fact that they can create something and we create it, like it's very simple material, like, you know, 
newspapers and fabric over um, and we have to figure out how to let them stand. It's all by itself. Um, so it was really fascinating just to see the process of it. Um, the, the fact that some characters just laying on the ground and some patients care less about that the character stands and some patients are very specific. This character must stand before I do anything. Wow. So that's like a matter of autonomy, right? Like being able to stand on its feet. Um, how autonomous this person is compared to the other. Um, and just, you know, to see, they, I think they were surprised um, to see what came out um, from the doll making. Mm -hmm. A lot of, um, what was it? And some very disturbing doll also came out too. Like mm -hmm. very disturbing, very bloody, very like um, non-human, you know, like cathartic. Yeah, like you mm -hmm. said, they they definitely have these moments to, you know, because unconscious will come out while you're making something and then you are surprised. And, but when the patients create those um, very unconscious, like this, this, but disturbing for food, right? It was disturbing for me, but sure. it, was, it may not be disturbing for that person. And we process it together. Um, and I don't want to go to the specific of their case, but a lot of their issue comes out. Um, and it was really profound to see like their, you know, after they create the doll, they start connecting the dots. Oh, right. because of this is what I was feeling. It came out in here. It came out in the door. And then now how are you going to deal? How are you going to cope with these issues that you cannot do anything about in your life? You've described the island making and the doll making. Are these, uh, are, are there specific artistic techniques that you always return to with like say you get a new client and you think oh well I'm going to go through the stages of first we'll do the island then maybe we'll do the doll or or is it does it always fluctuate and change what projects you do with them I think fluctuate and change um the the setting that I work is pretty um stable, meaning it's a majority of the patients I work with, I have been working with them over a, a decade. Oh. So yes, um, I am more like searching, like, what are we going to do this year? What are we going <laughs> to do this year? What I experience is a lot of time people look down on art therapy and you know, I'm like, what can art do? Like, what is the point of making a doll? Mm -hmm. um, but you know, this, when, whenever they say, I'm not a great artist, I'm not an artist, I don't want to be here, then we need to really start talking about, you know, it's the being in art therapy, it's not about being a great artist or creating a masterpiece. It's, it is about the process of you learning uh, about yourselves, uh, you learning about yourself through the creative process, through the creative product. Um, so, that, you know, for the new people, um, a lot of time I have to start explaining to them from that that place. And a lot of time, the the old uh, people, the people who has been in my groups for decades, they will tell the newer people, "Yeah, you don't have to, you know, you don't have to like draw nice. Yeah, you know, <laughs> just stay here and enjoy yourself or something." And they'll that, listen to each other. That was exactly my next question was asking those who say I'm not a good artist and how you mm -hmm. overcome that because we at four A's believe that everybody is an artist. Everybody yeah. has creative expression within them. Unfortunately, the more we grow up, the less we might indulge in our creative expression. But how did you get into art therapy? So yes, I, I was in Japan. I, I was born and grew up in Japan. And I knew that I've always been interested in arts and uh, human mind, psychology. But back then in Japan, um, I mean, you know, Japan is still very um, male-dominated society. And any medical field uh, is owned by 
Japanese men and doctors and very hesitant to accept um, these newer approach in like psycho um, therapy and then art therapy, drama therapy and then all of that. So back then, I mean, now it's changing. Luckily, I'm very happy that it's changing slowly. Um, but back then, it, there's no such a thing as uh, art therapy in Japan. And I was in the library like when I was like 12, 13, 14. And I was just looking at this magazines. And then I saw the word art therapy in Japanese. It's geijutsu shinri ryoho. That's the word, geijutsu shinri ryoho. And I just like, it tricked my, like, it's, I had such a strong reaction to the word. Like, what is this? Like, what is this meaning? Like, what does it mean? And then I started research uh, on my own. And back then there was no internet. So um, I don't know how I did it. But then like I started like writing the letters to some people who may know about art therapy in Japan. And then long story short, I realized uh, there's no way that I can study and learn about art therapy uh, in Japan back then. So I decided to come to the United States um, to study art first, fine arts. That's because um, I spoke to the, the director of the art therapy uh, graduate program. And what she told me was to become an art therapist, that's like being the translator. If you don't speak the language flu fluently, then you cannot become an art therapist. Me like her language meaning like creative arts. So she was saying it's better for you to major fine arts in undergrad, so you become fluent, uh, you know, in in this artistic language. So when you study art therapy, then it will all start make sense. Um, so that's what I did. I studied fine arts in undergrad, and then I went to graduate uh, to study art therapy. That's so interesting, and that's what brought you here. Um, yes. So having grown up in Japan and mm -hmm. then coming over here to study fine art, was there a cultural disconnect or a cultural barrier in the way you approached art in your Japanese context and history versus American sensibilities when you got um, over here? Yes, the fine arts, uh, I mean, my undergrad um, was a really funnest time. <laughs> like I was very... Uh, and then I can, you know, this is my art, so I can openly talk about it. But yes, I struggled to accept how Asian women has been objectified, right, in American society. So uh, one of the 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 project that I did um, while I was in the undergrad fine arts, um, I actually dress up like geisha, right? But a very casual way of geisha. Just like I asked my mom to say me kimono and then I purchase all this like a makeup and I dress up myself as like geisha, like a um, right. very casual geisha. And then did like, like I go, I went to McDonald's and I just like ate hamburgers so aggressively <laughs> in the geisha attire and the makeup. <laughs> You know, but that's like really questions like what what it means to be an Asian woman in American society, what kind of expectation people have on you just because who you are and how you look. Um, another performance I did was like I went to the Central Park and then I started cutting my hair. Hair is a symbol of like sensuality, sexuality. Um, so, I, I mean, like looking back, I didn't really... Um, know why I was doing what I was doing, but mm -hmm. like now I, you know, what I can say is I was really struggling to accept this, who I am, uh, my identity, searching for my identity and what people thought who I was, mm -hmm. who I am. Um, so yeah, a lot of struggle. Going back to, you use the word impulsivity a lot with both mm -hmm. your um, patients. Mm -hmm. And even I think when you were talking about your son's uh, portrait of you. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And I'm curious, with children, we probably have to do, when you're, when you're doing artistic work with children, 
you don't have to encourage encourage them to be impulsive because they just are impulsive and they right. uh, draw impulsively from their emotions, from deep um, feelings that they have because they haven't been repressed. And then right. it seems to me with your patients, they're struggling with their impulsive decisions in life, which mm-hmm. has uh, is related to their mental health mm-hmm. and what has probably landed them where they are. But then you as an art therapist, you're probably trying to encourage their impulsivity in their creative expression. Is that right? Oh, interesting. Well, in true, I think intuitive, um, maybe I would say intuitive. So, right. Um, You say many interesting things, Gabe. So I have to report, like I have to process what you said. I think the children are impulsive, but I feel like they're impulsive, but it's impulsive, but like seen as intuitive, right? Like kids don't hesitate to put red uh, thinking like it's going to ruin the picture, right? Because they're following their intuition. That's what I want to do right now. Uh Um, And it's I I don't really differentiate myself when I am with kids and creating arts or when I'm with my patients. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I just have to make sure they're safe and protected. Um, um, and I feel like a lot of time when I work with my patient, there is a lot of um, like like self doubt. Right. Because Mm. of the mistake that they made, they don't trust themselves. And that's why they will often say, I'm not a good artist. I don't want to be here. I'm not a good artist. And so actually, yes, there are patients who's very like impulsive on the paper, especially when they're psychotic. They're just like all over the place. So for those patients, I control, like I, I provide more control on the medium. In other words, if the patient is so like fragile and moody and, you know, you don't give them paint or clay, which is essentially very regressive material, right? So you give them a little bit more uh, controlling um, sort of material like uh, crayon, uh, crepas, um, less messy, but I would not give them pencil if they are like actively psychotic and if they're like about to attack you, I'm not going to give them like long pencil but I will give them some medium that they can self-contain and gain the control over their, you know, mental status. Um, So I'm not sure that that I encourage impulsivity um, um, in like, I I don't have the, but what I encourage is I encourage their intuition they need to trust yeah. their own judgment and, you know, just follow your intuitions. If right. you feel like to do this right here on this mo- at this moment, as long as you're not hurting yourself, as long as, not as you know, they're cutting themselves with the scissors, uh, I'll let them do it. And the, the owning the process is very um, therapeutic for them because they have to give up everything, right? They can the 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 mindset um, that they have is I cannot trust my own mind. And can you imagine living like that? That not would be being terrifying. able to trust yourself. Yeah, that is exactly mm-hmm. exactly. So you in the art, like in art therapy, in the creative setting, the therapeutic setting, like you restore, you encourage them to restore this sense of self and autonomy and the trust in themselves. Uh, it is okay to do this. Um, some patients cannot create anything without asking, am I doing okay? Can I do this? Am I doing okay? And, you know, you have to really like I encourage them you you what is your what do you what's your mind say is that okay to do that then you should follow what your mind is saying like what you know your intuition is saying yeah I'm curious in very base terms how often do you think there is a line between mental health and artistry in that 
how often do do the artists that we celebrate as being the great uh, the, the greatest artists in of all time mm-hmm. how often are they suffering from ment- what we would consider mental health abnormalities mm-hmm. versus what we would conventionally say oh they don't have mental health issues. I mean, mm-hmm. you know, in in basic terms, I don't want to use the word crazy, but I want to say how often are artists crazy? But yeah, well, but and you I have to like yeah, yeah. The society somehow expects you to be a little crazy, right? There's always like sensationalism sells, like the same as you know, like it's it's like Van Gogh. Um, like if we if he didn't have the bipolar disorder or whatever the you know, what he suffered, did he, like, is he that famous now? Mm-hmm. Yes, I think it's a, it's a very, a part of it, I think the society wants artists to be somewhat eccentric and sensational, right? Like, that's that's a part of cell. Mm-hmm. Um, and... On the other hand, um, I, I really don't think there is a fine line. I mean, we all are neurotic, right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> like the the fine, there's no such a thing as fine line. I like that's one of the things that I I am very humble that I am not. Yes, I am not a patient now, but mm-hmm. I can easily become on the other side of the door, right? Like <laughs> right. if I do what I did, like if I if I act on my thoughts, right? Like right. Um, your impulses. Impulses, <laughs> right? <laughs> exactly. Like if I, yes. So I think there's a really, like, there's no line. I mean, there is it's hard to differentiate mentally well people versus, um, you know, mentally ill people. It's mm-hmm. just, it's a labeling afterwards. Right. Um, good friend of mine says normal is just a setting on the washing machine, <laughs> 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 but we all yes. are on a spectrum of our own neuroses, like you said, yes. and our own, yes. um, we all have a mental health. Uh, th- there's a, there's a a spectrum of mental health and that health is a, it's a spectrum and we all yeah. sit somewhere on that spectrum and i suppose it seems to me that historically certain elements of mental health lend itself mm-hmm. to what the rest of us mm-hmm. think of as extreme creativity yes whereas Definitely. an awful lot of the artists are just trying to survive in their minds does that yes. ring true for you Yes, definitely. Well, that is why the DSM Diagnostic Diagnostic, uh, Statistical Manual, right? DSM is like, like it's it's like a living document. It continues to um, evolve and revise uh, according to the society's norm. Um, So I I 100% agree with what your friend said. Uh, What is normal is really... It's illusion, the total illusion. And when it comes to creativity, yes, you know, there are, I, the, one of the reasons I became art therapist was because I thought I cannot, I can never defeat or be better artist than the people with mental illness when they create art. Um, there is a the uh, field called outsider art, right? Um, it's so fascinating the storytelling, the 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 context of the outsider art is so fascinating. And you know, studying fine art um, for a second, I thought, oh, maybe I can live as an artist, like I can make a living as an artist. But then what? I, I am not interested in the art. Um, that doesn't have any storytelling behind. And to me, the outsider art was much more fascinating. And that's why um, I didn't choose uh, to become professional artist, but I wanted to be a witness of this outsider art. And that's, I think that's one of the reasons I chose to be an art therapist. That's so interesting. So now... 
I'm curious to think about the relationship between uh, you and your your patients versus you as a mother with your children. Do you mm-hmm. cultivate lots of art for them? And does it ever <laughs> seep into the realms of art therapy with them and your parenting style? <laughs> Well, I'm sure there are definitely some overlap. Um, yes, there's definitely some overlap. Um, and what I do essentially is really to protect, you know, if I am in my my work setting, I, pre- I will make sure to protect the patients. Like I don't let them to leave the, the room unless they feel, you know, they're, they're safe again. Um, in other words, if anything disturbing, um, you know, like if the, it's if anything dis- coming out from them, we will process. And we always, metaphorically, we always give them um, a choice to make. So, for example, um, a patient's, you know, while we're doing some meditation and patients start talking, thinking about their trauma, the past trauma. And so instead of just let them leave with an open wound, we will give them a choice. So what would you do if you were in the same situation again? What would you do differently? And then talk about the the strengths, the talk about the coping skills, the talk about the choices that now they can make instead of like reliving in the trauma now they have a new tools to uh, create the different ending for their traumatic event. So we won't just let them just leave as, you know, they feel vulnerable and hurt. And the same thing for kids. Um, if they let the superhero just dead, um, I will tell my kids to, you know, like now superhero is dead. Now the, the world's going to be all evil like we don't want that right so like what can we do to like revive the the superhero or is does he have a friend that can help him or could he like come back to life again so like always try to have a peaceful I'm not sure the peaceful is the right word but we don't want art to become the place that they can you know uh, have the violent um, mind and ending. Like we want the art to be the solutions um, or suggestive of the solution to to their ending. Like to their how do I say? Um, leading to the solution. So once again, uh, it's part of your philosophy that art can be a tool for problem solving. Yes. It's not just yes. an, it's not just an indulgent um, escape from mm-hmm. reality or whatever. It can be a tool for making the world a better place for everybody all the time. Yes, hmm. and problem solving. Yes, why didn't I think about the words? I'm sorry. Oh, <laughs> problem solving. Yes, no problem solving <laughs> is the yes, and that's very you know starts from the starts in a very small moment. Like if they feel like they had a choice or tools to solve their problems then it's accumulation of that will lead into their like you know that I, now I can trust myself now I can trust my judgment and then once the person can trust themselves then they will act differently in the society and then that leads to yes we're you know what we do essentially making the world a better place amazing yes when you were growing up what artist or piece of art or genre or uh, artistic element inspired you most? Um, Zhao Wuki. He is a painter. Actually, after I spoke to you last time, I did a little bit of search if he's still around. I'm not sure he is still alive, but he is a painter. Uh, I think his um, origin is like being Chinese, Zhao Wuki. I just remember the sensation that um, I experienced when I saw his painting for the first time. And it was just pure red on like very large sheets of paper or canvas. Um, and the the sensation, right? Like, like when you realize, oh, wow, that can be an art. 
and the evokes a lot of emotions um so yes i was very young um around 10 9 8 something like that i was just i remember the sensation uh that i received from seeing his artwork um, and it was almost it was like a physical and mental sensation that the experience really stuck with you and affected you huh how do I say that? The reason why I say sensation was because I just remember being shocked, right? Like, and shocked in a way, like, it's just all chaotic, mixed feeling. I was like, elated, like, like excited and upset and, you know, like, sh- shocked that this could be an art, yet it evokes such a strong reaction within me. And it was beauty. I remember crying, maybe. Maybe I'm dramatizing now, but I just, it was such a strong, like, bulk of emotions that is not just a single layer, just, like, shocking. Um, And beauty, just, like, purely beautiful. I love red. Um, When I create my own art, I cannot... Like this, the, the frustration I get is I'm not getting the pure red. So uh-huh. I started using my own blood and my hair and my essential, like it's very strange, like my desire to make canvas like a human, like I, you know, I want the canvas to be like um, fresh tone. And then I draw the black line, just like my hair. And then I want the drop of red, just like a blood. And it's it's very strange, um, very strange sensation that I receive, like when I'm creating my own art. And it's That's never cool. enough. Wow. That is so expressive. That is a sensation <laughs> you just described. That's yes. for sure. <laughs> Sensations, yes. Very sensational, yes. Yuko, I think the world is a better place with you in it, uh, helping your patients and helping society and just being able to have conversations with me like this and with our listeners because it is you bring another element and another... Um, dimension to the way you've spoken about art and the art that you've created. And I, I hope that you will leave here at some point in the next week to just give yourself a little art therapy of your, of your own and just do some art for, for art's sake. Huh? Yes. No, that will be great. Um, we all need to do that. Yes. And, you know, I think you're right. Like this art should be accessible to everybody and you know i'm very sorry to the listener that i cannot be more specific for you know the the case um the each patient's case it's such a fascinating things happen and i'm Mm -hmm. dying to talk about it but i also i'm obligated to protect the patient's um privacy of course you've shared plenty you've shared plenty and there's no apology necessary it's it's been all this is all informative and educational i am certain great Um, Thank you, Yuko, Thank very, you. very much for the work you do and for sharing your time with us. Yes, and thank you for what you do, Gavin. <laughs> I can't wait to have you on for a part two or part three or part four to, um, to explore <laughs> even more. But until then, um, yes. go make some art, okay? Yes, I will try. <laughs> yes. Thank, <laughs> thank you. you.